John Asraf is the CEO of NeuroGym and one of the leading mindset and behavior experts in the world. He went from being a teen who was often getting in trouble with the law to writing two best-selling books, being featured in eight movies, including the blockbuster hit The Secret and building five multi-million dollar companies. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Top 10, top I got a top 10. 10 top got my motivation high for my top 10. Top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. And men. All my life. Like now. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person that you know, but you also know that you're capable of more and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, John Rasseraf and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one, heighten your awareness. I want to separate like behaviors and emotions. So usually when people say they have, they're having a bad day, Sure, certain things may have gone wrong or something that they tried to do, you know, didn't work out. Mm -hmm. All information and experiences are processed at the non-conscious brain first, and then it gives rise to something we call a feeling. So emotions are processed non-consciously. The electrical and chemical reaction to that is called a feeling. So when I'm not feeling the way that I want to feel... Mm -hmm. I don't focus on the feeling. I focus on the cause, the neuroelectrical charge that's occurred in my brain. And in most cases, it's something that you're doing to interpret an event that's causing the neuroelectrical signal, causing the feeling. So in meditation, for example, what, why do you meditate? Well, obviously, it's great for a whole host of, of health reasons, yeah. whether it's, um, it's uh, less stress, less, uh, you know, lower blood pressure, uh, uh, less cortisol release, et cetera. But the one thing meditation does more than anything else is it gives you the ability to have a pause of awareness so that you sense what's happening at the non-conscious level. Right and what's happening outside of you. So when somebody behaves a certain way, it's processed at the non-conscious level, gives rise to your conscious mind for you to respond. And so when something happens, I like to be able to check in so that I don't react and I have the ability to respond. And if you do that enough through mindfulness, being aware, just being aware of exactly what's going on, then you have fewer and fewer of those times. So, you know, uh, uh, something happened last week. I was uh, in a hotel room and I spilled some water on a shirt that I needed um, hmm. for a wedding that we were going to. And my wife was like, oh, fuck, da, 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 da. She was going off deep and I was just calm. Yeah. And she goes, aren't you worried about this? I said, will it help? <laughs> right. Like, no, let's just figure out what to do. The accident already happened. Rule number two, change your beliefs. When I was a kid, I had a lot of my own challenges. I didn't have confidence in myself. I didn't believe in myself. I, um, I had some big challenges, you know, with the law and getting into trouble in school and getting into trouble outside of school. And I was really fortunate when I was 19 years old, I met a wonderful gentleman who was very successful with his family. He was very successful giving to charities. He was very healthy. He was very uh, gentle and kind. And he really wanted to do good in the world, not just for himself, but to make the world a better place. And he started to teach me that the reason I was getting into trouble, the reason I wasn't getting great results was what I believed about myself. And he taught me the power of my beliefs. He taught me the power of, you know, what I do every single day matters. He taught me the power of the intelligence in the universe that I could utilize my brain like a radio, you know, sends a signal out into the universe. He said, you could send a signal out using the power of your thoughts. He says, but you're also capable of receiving information, just like the great inventors, whether it was Albert Einstein, whether it was Edison, Michelangelo, any of the great inventors, they had these ideas that mm. came to them and they were just normal human beings, but they took advantage 
of the messages that they were getting in their hearts and their intuition. Wow. And so he taught me some of the power of the brain. And by using what I learned, I learned that I could achieve a lot more than I ever thought was possible when I was younger. Rule number three, understand your story. Part of the work that I love to do now is, is really help people understand what is your story? Like, what's the story you're telling yourself? Because we all have a story. We have a money story, a relationship story, a health story. A, we have a story for everything. And then that story keeps recreating our lives over and over and over again. And we have beliefs that support the story. We have habits that support the story. We have people that support the story. We have systems that support our story. And so my question that I always ask people, who would you be with a different story? Rule number four, build your self-esteem. I was born in Tel Aviv, Israel and uh, moved to Montreal because my parents were uh, tired of raising their kids in a worn, torn part of the world, which was, you know, in Israel and the Palestinian areas. And I'm sure everybody felt that same way in that whole region. My parents moved to Montreal from uh, Israel. And at the time, I really had a hard time learning the French and the English language. And I developed some, I guess, self-esteem issues that I wasn't smart enough or as good as the other kids because I couldn't communicate uh, when I was really young. And then I got into a lot of trouble uh, as, a, um, as a young teen from the age of 12 to 17. I got into a lot of trouble with the law, mostly because I had low self-esteem. If you can believe that, um, I did at the time. Hey, this is John Asraf, and do you love good books? I love to read because there's so much wisdom in books. You get to take somebody else's knowledge, skills, research, pay 15, 20 bucks, and you learn so much. Now, I'm reading this awesome book called Built to Serve. Find your purpose and become the leader you were born to be. And one of my new friends, really smart guy, really great guy who serves a lot of people, Evan Carmichael, um, wrote it. And um, I'm gonna read a little bit from chapter number one. And, um, I love this piece, and uh, maybe it's because I just watched uh, the series on TV on Michael Jordan, The Last Dance, which is really great, by the way, also. But one of the things he says here is everybody has Michael Jordan talent at something. Everybody has a Michael Jordan talent at something. You just haven't found it yet. Or you have and you don't believe in yourself enough to go all in to go all in, right? And you're a genius. I believe you're a genius. And so does he. You're amazing. You were not meant to live a photocopy of someone else's life. You were not created to wake up and do work that is below your capabilities. You have Michael Jordan level talent at something and you need to uncover exactly what your purpose is and how you can serve and use the serve. So lots of pearls and gems and motivational pieces. Pick up Built to Serve. Evan Carmichael, rising star. Rule number five, make longer term commitments. When we talk about how do we create rituals or how do we change habits um, that last, the first thing is to have a different expectation than I'm gonna change in a day or a week or in 21 days. Whenever I try to change anything, my number one rule is 100 days or I don't even start. So if I want to, let's say, stop oh. caffeine, it's a 100-day commitment. So first I make longer-term commitments and then I design a plan to retrain my brain around the expectation of following through. I make pre-commitments in advance. So if I say, let's say I'm gonna stop drinking coffee. Yeah. I say, okay, I'm gonna stop drinking coffee. I commit to it for 100 days. And then I write out, well, what will you do in the morning when you wake up and you want a coffee? What will you do when you're at a restaurant with friends and everybody's having a coffee? What will you do? So you counter any of the behavior when you know the trigger is gonna happen. Every habit has three parts to it. There's something that triggers the, the, the emotion, there's the behavior, and then there's the neurological and biological reward. 
So when you understand the habit part of any ritual, you understand that because we are conditioned a certain way, we're going to have a trigger, whether it's a flower, whether it's waking mm. up, whether it's a, a girl or a guy or, or children coming home, it triggers a response in the brain or reaction in the brain. Well, if we change the behavior over the course of 100 days, we'll still get the reward and if we pre-commit to what we're going to do when we say, oh, maybe today I'll have the coffee and tomorrow I won't. Mm. Uh, maybe today I'll have the pizza or the dessert and I'll, I'll catch up tomorrow. Well, if you pre-commit in advance that you're not going to take that action, then that's step one. Step two is when you have the trigger, if you interrupt the behavior, for one or two or three or four minutes, you interrupt the neural pattern in the brain also. So you come up with strategies is when I feel like having a coffee or dessert or the pizza or the croissant, <laughs> okay? Then here's what I'm going to do instead for five minutes and that way I can interrupt the pattern. If you do that long enough, You'll start to develop a new neural pattern. You'll start to develop a new behavior. And if you do it for at least, you know, 66 days, but preferably 100 days, you'll start to develop a new way of thinking and being and doing that will overshadow the other pattern in the brain. Mm, very interesting. Yeah. So there's, there's, a, there's a, a psychology behind it. But there's also the neurological processes of the brain. And what happens is our brain doesn't like change. Yeah. So any time that there is change, the brain see it feels uncomfortable. As soon as it feels uncomfortable, it'll send signals to the motor cortex of the brain. It'll send um, messages and we'll start to rationalize. We'll start to tell ourselves, well, I shouldn't do it because of this. Well, maybe today is not a good day. Well, I'll start today, you know, but I won't continue till next week. Or, you know what, I really don't want this. And we start to talk to ourselves. Mm. And when we understand what the brain does whenever we try to change, then we can start being in control of the brain and we can override the automatic responses. There's something called automaticity. And automaticity states that anything that I repeat over and over and over again over a period of time will go from conscious effort, deliberate yeah. conscious effort, willpower or persistence, and it'll become automatic. So we just have to know how long that is. And some things take a week, some things take 60 days, some habits that people have for 20, 30, 40, 50 years take 200 days. And so you start off with a 100-day window, and you ask yourself, am I willing to give a little bit of effort for 100 days to remove this destructive either thought pattern or destructive behavioral pattern in order for me to have something greater and better than what I have right now? Mm. So it's very important. You, you focus a lot on what you will have or what you, who, you will ha who you will be in the future to keep your, your yeah. motivation. Yeah, if you think about this, one of the best examples that I ever came up with is imagine if I give you a Hollywood script right now, okay? And I say to you, um, if you learn this script for the next six months, I will give you $10 million dollars to be on stage to deliver that. We're going to film you. And if you're amazing, you're going to have a chance to win an Academy Award. What will you do with the script starting today? I start to learn. <laughs> you start to learn. You start to read it. You start to emotionalize it. You start to practice it. You start to, you start to do everything possible to become something that's in writing. Something that came out of somebody's head that they wrote a script for that you don't have any idea what it is. But if you made a commitment to becoming that person and you rehearsed it and practiced it every day, you wouldn't get it right the first day or the first week. Or the first month. <laughs> or the first month. But if you knew there was a big payday, emotionally, spiritually, financially, 
and that people would go to the theaters and love to watch it and they'd laugh or cry or be sad and be happy because you were able to take them on a beautiful emotional roller coaster ride, then you would become that role. Yeah. Most people are interested, they're not committed. And the difference is when you're interested, you do what's convenient and what's easy. But when you're committed, you do whatever it takes. Mm. I love so, that. <laughs> yeah. so, Can you repeat it? Sure. When you're interested, you do what's easy and what's convenient for you. Yeah. But when you're committed, I'm going to get that result. You put everything into it until you get the result. Rule number six, train your subconscious mind. This is going back sometimes, so I think in 1992 we were stuck, um, but I knew there was more possibility. There was, there was room for growth. And I wanted to figure out if the stuff that I did in the 80s when I was a kid, you know, that broke free, would it work with some of my agents? And so we took 75 agents, randomly agents said, hey, do you want to get into a six month program to like retrain your brain, your subconscious brain around your beliefs about what is possible for you to achieve, around your habits of what you have to do in order to achieve that. Um, and we focused on retraining their subconscious mind. And so for six months, they had to go through a process of listening to certain audio tapes, reading, reading certain materials every day and following the process of training their brain, specifically their subconscious brain, which controls 95 to 98% of all of our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors today. And within six months, that group increased sales by $100 million. Jesus. $100 million. And I said, holy shit, right? This is working. Uh, and so we started to teach some of what we teach now in NeuroGym. Actually, now we have the technologies, we have the systems that are far better than what we did back in the 90s. And we went from 1.2 billion to 4.5 billion a year. And it wasn't because we taught them any more skills to be real estate agents. Mm. We taught them how to change the way they thought about themselves. We taught them how to change their habits. Wow. Our agents who made $750,000 or more were in front of a client 75% of the time. And we asked all the agents that weren't in front of more clients, like, why are you doing that? Like, why aren't you in front of people that are going to help you earn more income? Oh, well, we're busy doing this and doing this and doing this. And they had stories and excuses and reasons why. Rule number seven, create frames. Here's something you could do quickly. It's, it's called a, a reframe. So, so let's say you're driving in traffic and let's say somebody cuts you off and you've been sitting at the same spot for you know, 20 minutes like I did this morning. <laughs> and somebody, you know, you're, you're maybe looking down at your cell phone because you have some time because you're parked <laughs> on the highway, <laughs> right? And um, somebody cuts you off. So you could automatically react, go, son of a bitch, I can't believe he just did that and just use all of this energy, the mm. cortisol, epinephrine, adrenaline that's flowing through your body and causing stress in your body. Or you can say, well, what if that person just found out their dog died and they're really trying to get home quickly? Mm. You go, oh, okay, I guess it's okay if she or he cut in front of me. Right. Or they just got a call from their mother, their mother fell. Yeah. Would you change the way you felt about it? And the answer is, yeah, probably. Mm. And the reason because you changed the frame. So you can learn how to create frames for yourself of how you see the world, how you see failure, how you see effort, how you see your habits, how you s create frames in advance that actually serve you mm -hmm. through awareness and response versus reactivity. Yeah. And that is what a lot of people who, for example, I'm going to go back to professional athlete. What do you learn how to do? respond in a variety of different ways in advance or through practice yeah. so that when it's game time, <clears throat> you're just unconsciously doing what you yeah. need to do. Rule number eight, respect your life. People have to make a decision what they want to trade their life for. Yes. Because every day we're trading our life mm. for the people that we associate with, for the business or job that we have, you know, for what we eat, for the health, for the enjoyment, for the fun, for the experiences. And you have to ask yourself, is my life worth trading for that? If it's not, today is a good day to stop. <laughs> I know that. Right? Yeah. But most people don't think that they're trading their life, you know, for something. They think that, you know, oh, there's tomorrow and there's next week. Really? Well, I have... You know, evidence to prove otherwise, that we have no idea 
you know, when the last breath will be. Yeah, we so at... let's trade our life every day as it's the most important thing in the world. And not from an ego perspective, from a, from a humble, grateful perspective mm-hmm. of, wow, I get another day to yeah. live and to, to enjoy. I can be grateful and, and for can that. Be grateful for that, but then to respect it. See, respecting your life means you're going to trade it for things that you feel are worthy of it. Most people, you know, ask themselves the wrong question. They ask themselves, you know, am I worthy of the goal and the dream that I have? And they should be asking themselves, is that goal, that dream that I have worthy of my life? Change the question. And if you say, yeah, I'll trade my life for that, good, then go and do that. Rule number nine, adjust your set points. Talk to me about set points. That was something really interesting in what you talk about around the stories and things that we carry that I found really interesting. Sure, so Maxwell Maltz wrote a great book many, many years ago in the, probably the 70s, uh, called Psycho-Cybernetics, right? And Maxwell Maltz was a, a surgeon who performed surgery on people. And what he noticed is even after plastic surgery that he performed on people, some people didn't see any change in their faces. And it was visible to everybody else, but not to them. Because they had a map of what they thought they looked like? Yes. Okay. So we all have a map of reality. We have a map of what we think we look like. Uh, and any deviation on the physical level to that map, to that visual uh, representation we have in our brains, that doesn't match the map, your brain deletes or distorts it. So when we were working with real estate agents or or when I worked with business owners, in addition to upgrading knowledge and skills, if you think about how, uh, let's say income, we have set points for how much income we earn. So whether it's 10,000 a year or 20 or 50 or 100 or a million, it doesn't matter. We, We get this set point and then we behave the way we need to behave and we feel what we need to feel to earn that income. And over a period of time, it becomes part of the brain's default mode network. So we develop set points for everything. And so if the set point's in the brain, and there's a psycho-cybernetic mechanism in the brain, a control and response mechanism in the brain, and it's our brain, why not learn how to reset the set point? And so now we're looking at what technologies are available to help, help reset that. Uh, what uh, evidence-based methods are there to set that or to reset that. And so when we take, let's say, visualization, right, and you start to see yourself, even if the picture is not clear in your mind, of achieving the next level of your success, whether it's releasing weight and keeping it off, getting into a relationship that you love and are happy, and whether it's to make two or three or five times more money and live a certain type of lifestyle that allows you to do the things that freedom uh, with having money allows you to do. If you start in your mind first and you impress that through conscious efforts into the subconscious mind, it then causes thoughts and emotions and behaviors. So I like to work from the outside in and from the inside out. So use both. Mm. I, I want every advantage. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip is reset your financial governor. Is your financial governor holding you back from doubling or tripling your income in the next six to 12 months? Now, you may be asking, John, what in the world is a financial governor? And I'll explain it this way. Many years ago, when the car companies were building engines that were faster and stronger and more resilient, cars could go 200, 250 miles an hour, some maybe even to 300 miles an hour. But because of laws in Europe and in the United States, These governors were put on the engine so that the car, even though it can go faster and perform even better, it was limited to about 155 miles per hour. So here we are, we have these cars that can go extremely fast, but for obvious reasons to conserve on gas, to be able to have more safety on the roads, and to keep us generally all driving around the same speed limit, we created these governors to put on engines in order to limit the speed at which the car can go at. Well, what does that have to do with you earning more money, you accumulating more wealth? And the answer is everything. 
if you understand that you have a conscious brain that wants to set goals, but you have a subconscious mind that is gonna limit your thoughts, emotions, feelings, and behaviors to what you are governed by, which is your subconscious mind, then here's one of the things that we have discovered. People who make $30,000 a year or 50 or 100 or $500,000 a year or a million dollars a year or more, their financial governor is set at a totally different setting than somebody who's earning less. So why does this make a difference? Well, it makes a difference because there's a part of your brain that chooses the goal that you want to achieve and there's another part of your brain that's responsible for everything else your thoughts, emotions, feelings, and behaviors. And so if you don't have coherence between these two parts of your brain, if you don't know how to remove the governor and reset it, chances are you're gonna have goals and dreams, financial ones and even lifestyle ones, that you're not going to achieve, not because you're not capable of doing it, it's just because you are wired, set, conditioned, programmed, whatever you wanna call it, to earn the income you're earning right now and maybe a little bit more each day, each week, each month versus doubling or tripling or quintupling your income. Now, let me give you a different visual for this that'll hopefully cement what I mean. Let's say you're in a room that has a thermostat in there and the thermostat is set to a nice and comfortable 70 degrees and you feel nice at that temperature. What happens if you open up a window and let's say it's winter and cold air comes in? Well, what happens is the mechanism in the thermostat that picks up what the temperature is in the room, picks up a deviation that cold air has come in the room. And what does it do? It sends a signal through the electrical system for the heater to go on so that the room gets back to 70 degrees. That's called a cybernetic mechanism, a control and respond mechanism that occurs in machines that we create them in or in animals like us. So whether it's hot air coming into a room or cold air coming into a room, any deviation from the set program activates the air conditioning or the heat until the program and the room are one and the same. That is a cybernetic mechanism, as I mentioned, and here's what happens in us humans. If you're used to earning 30,000 or 50,000, 75, 100, or 200 or more, or you are used to a certain lifestyle, any deviation up or down from that setting, that comfort zone, that programming, kicks in your nervous system so that you either turn up the jets and earn more based on what you're used to, or if you do really well for a week, a month, a quarter, you actually back off and sabotage your success until you meet the setting that you have in your mind. That is how a governor works in a car. That's how a governor works in your brain. So if you want to double or triple your income in the next six months, 12 months, two years, doesn't it make sense that you should reset your financial governor, the expectation point, the programming, the conditioning? Well, of course it does. What I've seen in my years of training, whether it's salespeople or entrepreneurs or individuals to make more money, is the ones that think that they could do it just by gaining more knowledge miss the point because there's a part of our brain that gains more knowledge but doesn't change behavior. What you have to do is reprogram your financial set point, your conditioning, the expectation point. And when you do that and you create this coherence between your goal and your dream and your subconscious programming, that is when your behavior starts to change. That is when fears dissipate. That is when you stop procrastinating. That is when you take inspired action and you don't sabotage the success that you are achieving. So in order to achieve your goals and dreams, you have to reset your governor, reset your financial thermostat. 
Now I've got a special bonus tip from John on how to overcome your fears that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know, what do you want to train your subconscious mind to do? Let me know, put it down in the comments below. And if you made it this far in a video, you're still here watching, give me a hashtag believe down in the comments below. I wanna celebrate you. We don't just watch videos here, we do something about it. So give me that believe in the comments below too. What do you think is holding people back from growing a business, starting and growing a business to a certain level? Well, initially what holds them back is fear. So fear of failure, fear of success, and then failure, fear of disappointment, fear of being embarrassed, fear of being ashamed, fear of being guilty, fear of losing money, fear of yeah. fill in the blank. There's over 50 different types of fear that holds most people back, but they're unaware of it. It's like a, a silent hidden enemy that's locked deep in their non-conscious brain. And this is the area that, that you know I study and it's my life's work now is understanding what actually drives the perceptions that people have about themselves and what's possible for them to achieve. And what's the difference between somebody who says, yes, I, you know, I want it, I believe I can have it, I believe I could do it, but then there's another voice that they listen to more that says, but you're not smart enough, but you're not good enough, but what if you fail, what if you succeed? So there's, there's voices in our head that most people have not learned how to really just pay attention to. Because the, this, the voices that you hear, the thoughts that you're having, the conscious ones and even the non-conscious ones that percolate up to consciousness, if you pay attention, you can manage you know, where they go right. because that's what actually fires the electrical signal and the chemical response that drives behavior. Mm. And most people don't understand, you know, it's like a spark plug. The one spark plug, you know, turns the car on and you can push the gas and go. The other spark plug basically turns the car off and your brake is on. Most people don't think of their body, their mind as a system mm. that they actually own. And so we haven't been given the user's manual for that. So fear is one, uh, but then it's all the non-conscious conditioning that prevents people from, from uh, taking the actions that are needed. If you want 10 more awesome rules from Robin Sharma, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. Why? Because they have betrayed the visions, ambitions, values, mission in their heart. They have betrayed their talent.